Welcome. Good afternoon. It's uh, my great pleasure to report a little bit about robots that actually I changed and that the title a little bit, that roll, walk, and fly. Um, I skipped the swimming robots and I will concentrate more on the surface and the above surface robots. So let me start with what typically people think of what robots today do, and this is also actually what they do today. Robots are as actually extremely active in automation, assembly of cars, for example. They built our cars. Imagine you would have to build the cars we are producing every day today by human labor only. This would be extremely painful. Imagine that you have to paint and spray the robots as uh, humans. This would be really unhealthy. So robots are doing there in this field a wonderful job. But if you look at this video, there is no humans. There is only robots in this environment, so the robots have to be behind fences. And you can also rec recognize it's a very structured environment. So the whole pro production process is actually adapted to what robots can do today. And this is the reason why it really works so nicely. So the next generation of robots um, might be different. And this is the main um, focus on my talk today. And there was recently a video released from uh, Boston Dynamics, which was a company acquired a while ago by Google, then sold again by Google. I typically claim to say Google realized that they are good in software. It comes a little bit back to what Oliver this morning said, or this uh, early afternoon said, but they are realized also that hardware is much more complex than doing um, software. And if you look at this robot, you have the feeling that probably within a, a couple of years, or probably even tomorrow, we have robots which clean up our kitchens, which do all the, the job um, at our home. Unfortunately, I have to disappoint you. This video was somewhat a little bit faked. It's written in the text beyond the YouTube, uh, below the YouTube video. It has been a lot of teleoperation, a lot of very precisely programming. Today, there is no robot you can just put in whatever kitchen and cleaning uh, up the kitchen. But there is more or less all humans can do this. And this is come back. Uh, Oliver did a very nice presentation on this. Uh, the human intelligence is quite different than what robots can do today. So why is it difficult? Our daily environment, in contrast to production in industry, um, we have multimodal situations. We have a lot of different elements. We have a lot of unknown or partially known information, and we have to deal with this. We have to deal with uncertain information. We have not only to see with the robot's eye, but also to feel, to touch, to, to um, uh, interact with forces. All this is extremely complex and much co more complex than with what we can do today with uh, manipulators, arms, which are installed in industry. So our daily environment requires, for example, very soft and uh, good force control. So you touch the environment and you don't go only to a position. It needs new ways how to control this and, and uh, program these systems and how they can learn and adapt in the environment. So the future of robotics on one side needs all this improvement and new tools from artificial intelligence, but it also needs new ways to how to actuate, how to um, touch, how to feel the environment, you need new hands, new um, tactile sensors and so on. And it will still take a long time. You can see on the video again here from Velo Garage. It's a couple of years old, but we are not much further today. And this video is sped up 50 times. So this robot is doing somewhat a reasonable job, but still in a somewhat uh, um, tweaked environment, but at very, very slow. So I would like to give you some example, mainly out of our, our research lab on robotics, and I typically say that robots have two elements. One is the body, and the other one is the brain. Um, and we had also this morning heard that somewhat you need body and brain because intelligence, at least human intelligence, can only, or similar intelligence, can only evolve if you interact with the environment. So first of all, you'll need a robot which is well adapted to, to do a job in our environment um, in a sub certain uh, um, situation. We have the opportunity to work a lot with um, our students, and we have so-called Focus Project, which is the last year on the bachelor where a team of students, roughly about eight to eight, ten students, work an entire year on a project where they start with a mission 
and they end up with a prototype which really shows the functionality. And uh, most of these examples I will show here are somewhat linked to this. Most of them started as focus projects. So for example, a Beachwatch. Beachwatch was a collaboration with Disney. Disney has a research center at ETH, where I'm coming from in Zurich at the university. And they have not only the Disney parks and the whole movie and animation stuff, but they have also resorts. And they have resorts on nice beaches. And they came up with the idea, we want a robot which makes drawings in the sand during night, for example, so that in the morning you have uh, wonderful drawings on the sandy beach. And so our students uh, developed this robot. So on one side, it's a mechanical device which can grab into the sand. And on the other side, you need a system which can very precisely move around um, and follow trajectories so that, in this case, you can draw uh, the Nemo, Nemo and in the sand. This um, white uh, pillars, or, which are you can see, this is the reference for positioning the whole system very precisely. You can randomly put them, but you need a reference, and you have a sensor on top of the body of the robot, which uh, is a laser, which precisely measures the distance to these ob objects, and so can then make a drawing in the sand. Another element, which actually was also um, initiated by different people, um, was the question, today we have robots which can easily go on, on the ground with wheels. We have flying robots that can, can go in the free, free space, but if you want to go up on the ceiling and do something there, or on the floor, on the, on the, the walls, you have no robots. With the flying robots, it's very difficult to interact with the walls. You have to be in free space, and with wheeled robots, you cannot go up the, the, the walls. So the students took this challenge and said, we want to have a hybrid between flying and rolling um, robot, which not only can go on, on the ground, but also on the wheels. And so what they did is they have a robot which has four wheels, similar to a car, but then has two propellers as actuation units. The wheels are not actuated. The only front wheels are steered. And with these propellers, you can actually generate force in all directions um, by having this on a, on a, um, a, a pan tilt uh, unit, similar to it. And now, if you do this correctly, you can actually generate a force against the wall. You can generate a force to, to compensate gravity so that it doesn't fall from the wall. And then you can generate a force which actually propulses the whole system forward. And all of a sudden, you have a system which can really go also on walls. Um, and this was somewhat an education project, but there was a lot of interest, for example, from civil engineers. They want to inspect bridges. And for doing this, they need the contact with the bridge. They have to have sensors which uh, do actually um, measurement of the bridges. So once um, you are somewhat uh, going at the limit with wheel system, you of course you can know from na nature that we can do a lot by walking. And one inspiration we got a couple years ago, probably about 10 years ago, um, is this type of video if you see what a dog and humans can do di di different things with legs. You can even walk for at least a, a short moment in the walls. And this uh, actually generate, generated a lot of m motivation and excitement to see, can we actually do with technical systems, with technical solutions, something similar to this. And one thing which can you learn from the nature is that we have a very nice way how we interact with the environment through our m muscles and tendons. So our muscles generate the, f the forces and, and the movement, and the tendons are actually elastic elements which protect our body from having really a very strong impact directly on our, on our bone, bones and allows us also to bridge, uh, recover energy. So it's like an elastic element. So the first thing, if you want uh, to in, get inspiration from nature, you try to do the same thing. You have a motor, in this case a linear motor or a, a rotational motor, two motors, and then you have in theory with the motor a spring. And this spring actually protects all which is behind, because you will have not high arm impact forces, you have a soft contact. You have also the possibility to store energy in the spring and recover it. So if you are running repetitive mode, you can actually re recover energy. And the third thing is the deformation of the spring gives you directly um, a, a measurement of the force, a very precise measurement of the force you are inter interacting with the environment. 
So we did then um, this, uh, develop this system a little bit further so that we can really integrate it in, in, a, in robot systems. And this is a robot which has this dual elastic actuation modules in, which makes the, same, the whole system much more robust, so they can, uh, they can move in different environments. So we have on each leg three, um, three motors. Each of the motors has this elastic element in, and so it makes it very soft as humans. We are really soft in the legs and allows to move in different environment very reliably, go upstairs, very steep stairs, or even do some jumps, where, for example, you can use the energy stored in the, bed, in the, the springs to additionally give a kick to do high jumps, similar as humans do. We typically go first down and jump up. Um, so this, uh, um, in one side, we can pre-stress the, 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 our, our tendons, but also get some additional energy from the movement. So the last field, flying robots, we were um, moving towards flying robots quite a long time ago once we realized that with small robots, you, can, you are extremely limited. As soon as you have little obstacles for small robots, it becomes very big obstacles. And so flying is the best. And if you look at nature, the smaller the species get, the more likely they are flying. So flying is a wonderful thing, also covered by nature and evolution. And we started with uh, quadrotors and multicopters about 16 years ago. We were obviously reportedly the first one, first lab worldwide, which had uh, one of the systems fixed uh, flying in the air uh, without, uh, uh, without uh, attachment. Um, but these quadrotors you can buy, they have very, very limited flight time. So we wanted to go further. And so one thing is, of course, fixed-wing airplanes can fly very long. Helicopters have the wonderful ability to really um, land and uh, get off the ground on a very small spot. And so, again, this started with a student project, uh, which is now a company called Vingtra, and they developed this system, which is the, probably the minimalistic solution with, uh, for a hybrid between vertical takeoff and landing, two propellers, two flaps, and it's a wing-only system also. And as soon as you're up in the air, you actually go over to fixed wing mode. And with the same device, about the same size, the same weight, you can fly about probably 30 times uh, further than with a helicopter. With this system, you can fly about one hour. So you can cover a big space. And it's used actually to do inspection and surveillance in agriculture now, or do just uh, take images for mapping um, the environment. The next uh, question for us was then, can we actually probably fly forever? Can we stay in the air and then actually charge our batteries with solar cells? And indeed, this is possible. So in 2008, we showed the first time with a small airplane of about three meters wingspan, about three, three, meters, three kilograms in weight, that you can fly more than 24 hours by charging the batteries um, with solar cells. And in 2015, we flew um, uh, more than four, uh, three days in continuous um, with a system which was a little bit bigger. And this system was then extensively also tested for some different missions. So la last summer we went to Greenland um, with the people actually studying glaciers. And they want to actually to go far from their base stations to go and take pictures from glaciers. And these type of airplanes are small enough they don't need actually to bring fuel up there, and they can fly for uh, at least 15, 16 hours. Typically, you fly them not more than 24 hours, because uh, during night, you don't do measurements, but you can fly very fast. Of course, these airplanes, they need actually um, landing uh, environment. It's very sh pretty short, but there in Greenland, where this mission was, there was no landing spot, and so they had to improvise and build something specially for this. So the next uh, question was, can we actually have airplanes which can move in all direction, in all orientation, and potentially then also pr generate forces against wall, against the ceiling, or against uh, uh, all uh, environment? And this, again, was um, developed by students. Uh, I mean, principally, it's a standard um, hex uh, hexacopter. But here, we have the propellers which can be turned. And thanks to this turning, you all of a sudden can actually move in all directions. And then you can equip this system, what we are currently doing, with robot arms. And all of a sudden, you are able to generate forces 
against wall, against all the environment, and interact with the environment and do um, interaction there. So the second part of my presentation, I would like to focus more on the intelligence. But as mentioned before, I think the, ho the whole body of the robot is part of the intelligence, um, which is, uh, of course, the first thing you have to do is perceive the environment. And today we have wonderful sensors. For example, we have laser sensors where you actually do measurement of time of flight. The laser pulse is moved out. If you measure how long it takes to, uh, to get back. And then, actually, if you know the time of flight, um, of the, the uh, of, uh, uh, of light, then actually you can calculate how far away this this object is, and then you have multiple beams. And if you have this uh, integrated in this type of sensors, then you can actually move around with that, this sensor, have intelligent algorithms which put all these measurements in a consistent way together, and then you can more or less on the fly build an, a map of uh, this this quality. This is at ETH, at my university, outside and indoor. So we just moved around this sensor. The algorithm put all the thing together in a consistent way. And at the end, you have um, a 3D map of the environment in resolution of something like centimeters. Um, to, and of course, this is uh, very wonderful, uh, very nice uh, for doing then navigation. If the robot has to move around, find its way around this building, you need this type of, of 3D map of the environment. The 3D sensors are still somewhat bulky. You cannot so easily fly them. They're expensive, they are big, and they're heavy. They need a lot of power. So of course, the more obvious solution for small devices is cameras. Cameras are all over today. They are extremely cheap, um, but they have some limitations. If you have an image, the camera image is actually losing the, the, the dimension of depth. So actually, you get a, a planar image out of 3D environment, so you don't know actually how far a certain point in the image is. Now you can say, OK, if you have stereo camera, you can actually recover this by somewhat triangulation. But if you have objects far away, you have still a problem because the, 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 the noise is too, too big and the distance of the cameras is too limited. But what you can do as soon as you have a moving robot, actually you move to another place, um, which is further away, and then you try to find points which you found in the first image, which are typically called features, which are sticking out. Now you try to, in the uh, in a, uh, image from a similar environment, or the same environment but other angle of views, if you want to find the same features, you can immediately, easily imagine that you can do some sort of a triangulation, and then you actually can recover the depth information. Of course, there is a lot of tricky elements, a very, very challenging task to find the, the same points in the two images. But this is today feasible, um, and it allows um, a lot of wonderful things. So we work together um, on this also with the Google Tango project. And today, with the newest generation of smartphone, you have this technology installed. And what this allows, for example, you go on a roller coaster, you do this tracking of these features from one image to the other, you combine this with the IMU, which is the acceleration and rotation speed measurement, and then you can in real time, on your device, actually estimate your motion. And motion estimation is needed for, for example, that you know where you are, but it's also needed, for example, for all this virtual reality and augmented reality. And so today, this technology allows us to develop really virtual reality um, augmented reality devices and integrate them on your smartphone. And this will really change in the future. You will be able to do games which uh, combine your real environment, your, uh, probably your apartment, and your uh, living environment with virtual elements. And of course, it allows also a lot of other, other elements to do. So cameras are also more and more used in, in cars. We know that uh, Google uh, and uh, um, uh, Tesla and, and some, a lot of other cars have cameras which allow them, for example, to track the street and keep the cars on the street. What I typically say, this is more or less you do electronically what a train is doing mechanically. So you keep them on the street. But these cars actually don't know exactly where they are with the environment. They have no one real understanding of the environment. They might be able to see other cars, but in some situations they are still somewhat limited. They have not a clear map and not a clear understanding. Now, what Google is doing with their car, they have also not only cameras, but also the 3D sensors we have been seen before. And with this, you then 
the, uh, you can see the, the environment in 3D, very reliable, also if the light is very bad, and then you can use this for localization. Here you can see the white points are the map, which was built before. The color points are the actual readings of the sensor, overlaid with the map and adjusted with the map so that you know where you are. So this, in combination, allows more and more really systems to fully autonomously drive in our daily environment in cities or on freeways. But I think we're still far from really releasing these units to the free uh, for, for everyday environment. So we can today, in very somewhat structured environment, go at high speed. This is freeway highways, which are pretty structured. We can probably at lower speed in more complex environment drive, but we are still far from on the, analyzing these type of situations where humans sometimes have also some problems. We have probably even more problems in this situation where you have actually to negotiate and to argue and, and give signs with other people. And of course, in the whole way, these systems have to learn and adapt. And then there is a couple of questions that I'll probably come back in the next to talk about this, about the ethics. How can we actually guarantee that the system learns appropriate thing, and how can we actually re release this so that we are sure enough that it's not dangerous for the humans. But eventually, if we can do this, we can actually use our infrastructure, and this is uh, not fully re reality, or somewhat also a little bit uh, for loving, but um, you can actually use the infrastructure much, much uh, better, because then the cars are so very good, so they can actually drive uh, next to each other and will never collide. Um, and of course, this is uh, fake, but there have been studies that you can actually do with the same amount, uh, amount of cars can offer much better mobility or actually use less cars for offering the same mobility for society. And this really offers very new um, concepts. So I would like to um, finish with a couple of our additional um, examples. I'm very convinced that robots will have an impact but probably not as our, our kitchen aid, as we have seen in the beginning, because it's very complex. But for example, in agriculture, where you have flying robots and ground robots combined together, can do a, a continuous surveillance of the environment. So for example, the flying robots has some sensors, for example, cameras and hyperspectral sensors, to analyze the field, see where you need more fertilizer, where you need more water. And then it can automatically send the ground robot out and uh, do bring in fertilizer, but also analyze the, the weeds and see which one are the good ones and which one are the bad ones. And then you can actually interfere here without spraying widely um, chemistry on the field, but for example, to mechanically interfere and destroy this on the field. And you can, I think you agree with me that this would, would result, will result in a much more um, sustainable agriculture and even with a better yield on the field. Today, flying robots are typically still controlled by humans. In the free air, we can easily navigate by with GPS, but as soon as you are close to infrastructure, you need more information. And on flying robot, you are limited in calculation power and, and sensor system, but still, today, it's uh, starting to become feasible that um, here it's a top view from a flying robot, which has to go to this end, and it builds with a camera, with a system on board, in real time, a 3D map of the environment. This 3D map allows actually to do estimation what is the best trajectory, and this uh, allows, for example, the system to fly uh, fully autonomously through the woods, where you have a lot of little um, uh, branches which have to be avoided um, uh, by just really building up automatically the 3D map of the environment and moving forward um, uh, in an appropriate way to do fully pass planning on the, on the road or on the uh, online to reach the goal where the robot has to be. And this allows us to uh, cover a lot of other new fields. I would like to finish with this slide, which uh, somewhat gives a little bit the, the future. Where will we be? I think we have to be careful that we are not over-optimistic. Robots will not solve everything in the near future. We heard this uh, already this morning. But they can do a lot of very good stuff, like in agriculture, in mining, and so on, um, for humans where probably humans should not be and don't want to be. Um, if you try to find out or classify a little bit the, the complexity of robotics, I try to have two axes. One is the, the complexity of the environment, from static to very dynamic 3D environment. 
And this is, for example, the car on the freeway. It's somewhat 2D and nearly static. This is only the other cars. Where the, where the, but there is other fields which is more, more dynamic. And the other complexity is mainly the type of interaction. We have already heard about how to grab objects. And I think household robots is probably one of the most complex. If you have to clean up a, t a, a, a table with old objects on it, you need tactile interaction, you need, need an understanding of the situation. Um, so this is probably the, one of the most difficult tasks. Even if we assume that our kids if they are five, six years old, they can help you on this. So for us humans, obviously it's not so complex. For computers, it's complex. On the other side, if you have to sum up a lot of uh, big numbers, computers can do this easily. We are not so good in this. So I hope that in the future we'll find the right way to share our um, load with, uh, with computers and robots. They do the jobs which we don't want to do and where they are efficient and we do the jobs where we are, fi are efficient and very good. With this, thanks very much for your attention, attention, and I'm happy to answer some questions if there are. <laughs> questions? Please raise your hands. Over there. Hey, uh, I was just wondering in regards to pathfinding and also using actual people to go into buildings to actually 3D map spaces. I'm an environmental artist with um, a few game uh, studios, so just sort of getting that sort of data so that we could actually put um, artificial intelligence into those spaces. Would you recommend actual people going into environments that they want to map themselves or getting into areas where... I'd guess drones or, or vehicles not being able to access those areas. Um, is there anything out there that's, that's obtainable in terms of getting that sort of data? Like um, something that uh, a, a person off the street could actually just pick up and actually start mapping a 3D environment to then to put it into a, um, into a game engine. Yes, in principle, if I have got it right. So yeah. now the next generation of smartphones will more and more offer this yeah. uh, element. Yeah. The first thing you have to ha know is, is very precise motion estimation and, and so, somewhat localization. Yeah. With smartphone, with, with feature tracking, you can do this. With, uh, with iPhone X, you have a very precise 3D tracking. Mm -hmm. And then you can actually take the, pic uh, the images. Mm -hmm. And then there is plenty of, of tools which allow to do a 3D map okay. out of images if you have a good estimate where you, this image was taken. Okay. So this um, will come. The question is only how precise you want to have this. Um, of course, it's not so easy to have a very precise uh, flat wall appearing yeah. as a flat wall. There will be some areas which are still um, covered up and you don't see it. But I think this is, uh, is uh, the next just step. around the corner. Yeah, yeah. That's right. thank you so much for that. Sure. Other questions? Um, I would like to know to the Google Tango project, that visual inertial system, it's used purely odometry or it's like a slam system? Yes, so uh, it's a good question. In principle, the first you, you start with odometry, but typically then you end up with slam. So we, our part for the Google Tango was very strongly linked with the slam. So you build really then with multiple devices. We have, for example, built a map of the, the whole um, uh, railway or the, the, uh, the train, uh, train station of Zurich, which is multi-floor, and so we just move around with multiple tablets, and then we build a map, a consistent 3D map. So it, it introduces, uh, includes both. And by the way, Google Tango also includes a depth, sim, a depth sensor, which is a time-of-flight camera, which then was pretty nice also to, to reconstruct the environment um, with, with a different type of, of sensor. And we can find this implementation in GitHub for the ETH? Or yes, some, some parts are, yeah. All right. Thank you. Sure. One is called, so we're a part of this Google stuff is in this map lab. It's open source, multi-robot uh, um, slam. Other questions? So let me ask you one, uh, Roland. There was a an accident with an autopilot system of a major manufacturer, uh, I think four days ago, and um, the car went with 100 kilometers per hour, and 
the driver walk away with just a broken leg. So what do you think uh, about this incidence? I mean, of autonomous driving or partial Yeah, answer. I mean, uh, autopilot systems. Yes. So, of course, I was asked if when this, uh, this um, Uber accident was a couple months ago. And I think we have to be careful that we are not moving too fast because it's still new technology. Somewhat we have to find out how can we verify. I'm pretty sure that in 20 years from now, we probably will actually discuss should humans even drive because then we have been able to show that autonomous cars will be safer. But in the transition, it's not so easy, and we have to be sure that we know where we control everything. So I think it's really a little bit bad. I think some companies are moving too fast. You can see that some companies, even they have the technology probably since a long time, like Daimler, Mercedes has, uh, has done a lot in this field, but they are not releasing uh, cars because they know that's probably sensitive. So um, we have to start on a level where it's safer than humans. And this is not so obvious. I think it will be obvious today. I think technology is ready for on three ways, but it's, we are not far from being ready in all situations. Um, interestingly, autonomous cars become interesting if you can handle everything, because then the car can go and pick your, your kids without you in the car, which um, is then the, a huge added value. But it's still far from there, and we have to be careful um, how to evaluate, how to test um, these new devices. Thank you very much.